Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to one and all. Welcome to Professor N. R. Madhav Menon Interdisciplinary Center for Research Ethics and Protocols, QSAT. I am Sharika Somashekaran Pillai, the MC for today's event. On behalf of the organizing committee, <laughs> on behalf of the organizing committee, I extend our appreciation for your presence as we celebrate the World Bioethics Day 2022. I would like to invite our professor and coordinator of ICREP QSAT, Dr. Vani Kesri, for today's welcome speech. Over to you, ma'am. A warm good morning to one and all again. Esteemed uh, Chief Guest of this inaugural ceremony, our own Registrar of the University, Dr. Meera, the Resource Person of the Day, Dr. Nandini Kumar, research scholars, students, faculty, and those who are visualizing this program virtually. In fact, uh, World Bioethics Day, as some of you at least would know, is the seventh series of the Bioethics Day, wherein the UNESCO adopted the UN Declaration on bioethics and human rights way back in 2005. Now, uh, you might be knowing as to the relevance of bioethics, still I need to put certain words on the relevance of bioethics as such. You find that the advances in science and technology have raised certain intrinsic ethical and legal questions as to the extent to which the scientist, the element of scientific inquiry within each scientist can go about. And especially after the Nuremberg trials, the question as to drawing a line in research frontiers undertaken by the scientist was being put across around the globe. And from then onwards, you find a series of legal and ethical regulations coming in as to protecting the human dignity. When the UN was established, the question of to what extent science could develop, to what extent the scientific instinctiveness in each individual could be realized in balance with maintenance of human dignity and worth was being considered. And that really prompted agencies coming under the UN to articulate legal regulations and ethical regulations in this realm. Friends, in when this particular declaration was being drafted, there was a question as to why do you want a particular declaration on bioethics and human rights? Since you have the other conventions in law, such as Universal Declaration on Human Rights, Universal Declaration on Human Genome and Human Rights, and so forth. But then, the UNESCO felt that there is a need for enumerating the different principles, ethical principles, which the scientists should undertake, given the situation in hand wherein science and technology is advancing day by day. So you find that this is just a declaration wherein it lays down certain principles which the scientist adhered, needs to adhere to. And it encompasses not only the ethical aspect, but the environmental aspect, the legal aspect, etc. So it is in this context that the World Bioethics Day is being celebrated all around the globe. Now coming on to my
my obligation of uh, introducing the eminent personalities here today. I think uh, I should uh, begin with the chief guest of this inaugural ceremony, Dr. Meera. She's the administrative head of this university and she has been supportive for all the activities undertaken by the center. A warm welcome to you, ma'am. The resource person of the day is Dr. Nandini K. Kumar. And uh, she is the Vice President of Forum for Ethics Review Committee in India. And my association with her was few years back when we chaired, co-chaired a session at School of Legal Studies, wherein she was at that particular point of time the Director General of Indian Council for Medical Research. And she was heading the bioethics unit then. And I was wonderstruck by the way she was presenting her ideas and her thoughts on bioethics. And that really prompted me to invite her for this, to deliberate with all of you here today. A warm welcome to you, ma'am. I would also like to welcome all the gathering here today, the student community, the research scholars, the faculty, uh, those from different departments of the university, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Today we have with us Dr. Meera V, Registrar of Kisat, former HD of Chemistry Department, SN College, Chertala, with 25 years of teaching experience, both UG and PG students. I invite Dr. Meera to officially inaugurate today's event. very warm morning to all of us, uh, uh, all of you who are gathered here, um, respected director, Dr. Vani, uh, today's um, invited speaker, Dr. Nandini Kumar, vice president of at Forum for Ethics Review Committees in India, uh, all other distinguished faculty members, dear students, As I have been introduced as a teacher of science for more than 20, 25 years, I think I should share uh, my views on bioethics, a few, um, like whatever suggestions or whatever I have discovered about bioethics before I enter into my uh, duty or obligation for today. I think that is a very, you know, um, interesting and important topic to all of us, which brings together the ideas of, you know, the philosophers, as uh, Dr. Nandini was mentioning, the physicians, the lawyers, and the scientists, maybe healthcare, and so many other professionals, which uh, deal with, you know, the ethical issues um, as a result of the emerging trends or the advancements in science and technology. But it is not only limited to this special groups of people. It is applicable to all of us. You know, science tells us that we can do wonders in the world when we let all the creativity, all the you know, brilliance of the entire mind of the universe together, no wonder we can do phenomenal things. But at the same time, we should, you know, um, to have or we should take care. There are checks and balances on that. Because science is not always leading to, you know, the favorable, the things, favorable things, or um, which are 
gainful to us. It can lead to bad things also. So uh, we know that humans are very special, very special in the sense that we have intelligence, we have an analytic power, we have, we can make our own choices, we can behave very brilliantly, and we have the responsibility to take care of, uh, you know, paying attention to the world around us. So, uh, what I can um, you know, emphasize is that the ethical standards are paramount among all these qualities. You know, we have that ineffable quality that cannot be replicated in artificial intelligence. And, uh, for example, suppose we have uh, uh, to introduce a new drug or vaccine and what we need is to do experimentation. A whole lot of experimentation has to be done for that. And we should also uh, take care that there are ethical standards. There are certain immutable principles that safeguard us what to do and what not. And this is where I think you know, the lawyers come in as the safeguards or the guardians of the society. And I hope this, uh, you know, the center, the special center for bioethics are the pioneers to make us aware of all the consequences, the good and bad things when we experiment with life, when we deal with human beings. So I, I am very proud to uh, say that this is going to be a very acclaimed globally uh, center in this special bioethics and in this world, I, I world environment bioethics day, sorry, world bioethics day. I'm very happy to inaugurate the invited lecture series. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for those wonderful words. Kickstarting today's invited lecture series, we have with us Vice President of Forum for Ethics Review Committee India, Adjunct Visiting Professor Kasturba Medical College Manipal, former Deputy Director General Senior Grade ICMR, former investigator, NIH project on bioethics at National Institute of Epidemiology, ICMR, Dr. Nandini K. Kumar. Ma'am, the stage is all yours.
can sit down and you can give me that mic. Audible enough? I used to be part of his, you know, um, organization of such meetings in the law school, Bangalore. It was very unfortunate that we lost him, but the, his memory will remain as the first director of law school, Bangalore, who encouraged learning in ethics. So, uh, coming to the subject proper, before I start, you know, I don't know how much you have been exposed uh, to various aspects of bioethics um, because I've got a crowd of slides with me. Uh, I hope I won't be boring you. If there is anything which is very familiar to you, you don't want to listen to it, just let me know. Okay. So when, uh, when did the civilization start? According to uh, the Christians, it's uh, Adam and Eve. But we know that civilization existed even before that centuries ago, okay, even before Christ. That's why we have before Christ and after Christ. So native cultures were there and they believed in um, the Panchabhutas, nature, the five elements of nature, okay. And then uh, they believed in the influence of cosmos. So Aham Brahmasmi, that is, I am the same as cosmos. So those elements are part of our body. That's why, you know, you say, what is the meaning of horoscope? Why do you have horoscope? What does it actually, let us not think whether you will do MBBS or law or something like that. Just tell me the importance of horoscope. What do you see in that? Huh? The? Planetary position. Now, you see, twins are born. Are they of the same nature? No. Isn't it? So one is born, at that time, what is the position of the constellation? And when the second one comes half an hour, this changes. So that actually influences your body. So the physiology of the body is dependent on constituents of nature or cosmos. So this was called cosmophysiology. Now at the same time, we also had this belief in um, superstition. So these were coexisting. Okay, people did not know much about God at that time, but they knew there is some superpower. At the same time, to easily appease certain things, they used to believe in superstition. Okay, these were coexisting. Against that background, we had our ancient practitioners bringing out code of conduct of physicians. So the earliest, uh, what you see here is actually the documented uh, evidence. Okay, so they say Siddha was the first uh, uh, which showed uh, evidence of Siddha, practice of Siddha medicine, that was 30th century BC. Then came Ayurveda, and there's a controversy, 10th century BC or 1st and 2nd AD, we'll not go into that. The point is that there were a number of documents available as Charaka Samhita, Shushruta Samhita, Vag Bhatta, and so on. We'll not go into details about that. Just suffice to know that these existed centuries ago. Much, much later, the modern world, can't say modern world as such, but 4th century BC, we had Hippocrates uh, enunciating uh, the principles. So from Hippocrates' tenets, what actually originated? Anybody, any guesses? What medicine, what medical system?
originated from the advisories of socrates uh, sorry uh, hippocrates we say hippocrates oath no which medicine hmm ayurveda ha huh? one person allopathy what did you say ha huh? unani how do you know ha huh? you don't know just guess no huh? any other guesses ha huh? naturopathy that came much much later and gandhi ji promoted it any other any other no most prominent system ha huh? which one group voice i can't hear physiology physiology is taught in which system medical system what are the medical systems in india come on ayurveda hmm 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 one thing ah siddha only brought the 30th century bc document no you forgot that so which took root from socrates uh, i'm always saying socrates hippocrates one person said yudani you actually went through so many medical systems just now no which one do you think guess have you heard of modern medicine what you said allopathy so the two systems that came in existence were unani medicine although it was your guess and modern medicine so they are young comparatively okay these systems are young compared to the centuries old systems all these are existing in india so it's a, a multi multi a medical system approach that we have to think in india but if you actually trace the global reaction no more towards the oriental hemisphere we find that the common principle that was enunciated was do no harm okay the greek philosophers also talked about it as primum non nocere if you actually translate it into sanskrit or hindi primum will be prathama no means na nocere will be nash okay it's do no harm so centuries ago this was spoken when we come to the indian philosophy i am not going into detail just bear uh, necessary things that you should remember two types dharma dharma uh, was divided into two sadharana dharma and vishesha dharma now sadharana dharma you may say general principles vishesha dharma you may say specific principles now general principles are nothing all of you know about it the common virtues no? so uh, it's universal in uh, nature and it is uh, actually Uh, can be implemented at all levels all times this is honesty compassion and all those things i'm not going to read and morality but there was also you know talk about not stealing that was also given importance vishesha dharma as i told you was a specific principle and what was this this was taking into uh, uh, consideration your environment okay the culture the local culture so because of that you know we have this uh, uh institutional affiliations we have the family background 
we also have the social status, the position of the gender. Those days, earlier days, women were not considered as, you know, uh, 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 mainstream gender placement. Mostly it was male dominated. That's why when I say about, you know, Ayurveda those days, I would say he. Okay. But today, if I have to talk, I will say she or he. I'll bring she first. We, uh, we write Mrs. and Mr. No, we don't write Mr. and Mrs. While well, we are invi inviting people. So on the same scale, she or he. But those days it was mostly he. So how to deal with the opposite gender, at what age of life, all these were described. So they were very specific in nature. And then professional obligations, how you have to behave as a professional. So they, these were actually applicable to yourself as well as to others. What ap was applied to yourself was called swadharma. Swa means self. And paradharma. Para means others. OK. So this is the simple way in which I can actually describe that. So whatever system you take, traditional systems of medicine, all actually required you to get that knowledge which would be beneficial for the patients. And what was this? Nothing but research, isn't it? When you are trying to get that information, it is research. And it is centuries of research which led to the practice guidelines. Whereas if you compare modern medicine, it is, you know, all evidence-based. You keep on doing research and then you come across some guidelines and say, okay, this is practice guideline. And then you discover some other medicine has come that is much better than this, then you change that guideline, you say that this should be given. Something like that, okay. But remember, the, these were not decades research, these were centuries research. So when we talk of ethics, what is its relationship when you are all alone? I'll ask one question. Um, you, what will you do if you were alone in the room? Hmm? If you were in a room alone, all by yourself, what would you like to do? Not sure. What would you like to do? You'll just sit. Anybody else would like to volunteer? Yeah. Huh? Singing. Very. I was actually looking out for that. Anybody for dancing? Ah, so many people. So you're not bothered, you know, you're in your room all alone. Nobody is watching you. You put on the music and then start doing all these things. Isn't it? You enjoy yourself. Some may like to sleep. Nobody is asking you any question. But if somebody else enters the picture, what would be the scenario? Full freedom? Hmm? No. Why? You become conscious. Why? OK, somebody is watching, but still, why should you be con uh, conscious? Ah, there comes ah, image. Why? What is wrong in that? Anything wrong? A boy or a girl walking together. Is there anything wrong in that? Then why you are conscious? Why you are conscious? Somebody will point finger at you. No? So that means you are influenced by your environment. OK. Now the same story in a village, how will it be? Ah, so that sound itself, oh, <laughs> shows what would be the reaction. So you see how the local environment is influencing your behavior. OK, so that means there are certain unwritten 
guidelines that you follow okay there are do's and don'ts your parents say don't do this don't do that and all that okay as you grow and then there comes a stage like you know in the urban this thing the girl would say uh, she will go with the boyfriend somewhere and suddenly you know the family discovers that and if she's confronted she says this is happening normally in my age group i just went with him to have a coffee nothing more than that argument okay but in a village what will happen you can imagine isn't it so you are con uh, actually controlled by the local environment but suppose some more people come like you people what will be your behavior you will be talking kala 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 bala 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 as long as the resource persons are not there or your teachers are not there isn't it the moment they appear in the corridor as it happened people became more silent so there is again a set of behavior okay now you are asked to wear helmet while driving in a two wheeler is it necessary is it by whom by by law okay so now you can't play around okay in your uh, house compound you may do that but the moment you go outside you wear a helmet isn't it so that is the relationship between ethics and law okay so ethics when you say it is the internal moral fiber how you conduct yourself and then there are set of guidelines to control your behavior and also a little more than that will be code which is sort of semi legal but it could also be legal and then you have law law stops you so it starts internally and stops externally okay that is the relationship between ethics and law sometimes law may not be ethical depending on the culture of that particular uh uh environment i would say a country whatever you have heard a lot about uh the iranian woman who was killed because she took off her hijab isn't it and in retaliation to that other women are also cutting off their hair and all that because it is not allowed in that country okay i don't know whether there's a law but otherwise there's an understanding okay but here you have the freedom whatever you may try to do unless a law comes in okay so that is the relationship now we also say about uh, you know mtp that is termination of pregnancy okay now that is not liked by the catholics they will never go in for that okay so they don't even do abortion in their hospitals so you are dictated by your religious social environment now when you talk of bioethics the easiest definition that was given uh, in the encyclopedia of bioethics is a systemic study of the moral dimensions to so moral okay including moral vision decisions conduct and policies of life sciences and healthcare employing a variety of ethical methodologies in an interdisciplinary setting that is what is most important it is moral dimensions in an interdisciplinary setting more modern uh, uh recently uh, a person defined it as multidisciplinary study again this is interdisciplinary okay of philosophical ethical social legal economic you name anything under the sun all comes under that and their application in human society and the biosphere so biosphere is coming there so that means environment is being taken care of now you come to little more of philosophy there is something called consequence like 
you are listening to me now as a consequence of that what happens hmm yeah new knowledge you are getting sensitized isn't it so that is a beneficial effect but suppose i was very boring then that would be a negative effect so it's a consequence okay so there is a relationship about your action and the consequence so when you actually do something and it brings greatest good for the greatest number can you actually give me an example for that greatest good for the greatest number immediately you can't think about it vaccination good so you are presuming that most of the society would be fighting against corona corona for the present but you have other diseases also okay so that is bringing greatest good for the greatest number okay now decision about this was to have some semblance of controlling corona in the society okay but have you heard of vaccine hesitancy so that is the other side okay so when we say about greatest good for the greatest number it means you are using people as a means to an end okay so this is called utilitarianism utility okay and teleontology is the uh philosophical term for that the other one is always act right whatever action you do okay now the vaccine hesitancy people thought that we are not going to take vaccine this is our right for them it is right okay but can you tell me uh, i don't think of the consequence ah if corona comes we will see to it then that's the attitude can you tell me any other action okay i give you uh, okay this is here what they actually say is do the right thing at that moment what you decide that should be right okay you don't care whether you know this will have after effect later you know there will be so many problems all those things you don't think now you are only basing your decision at the moment whether it is right or wrong that is called kantianism deontology okay now an example is the bomb was actually the world war 2 stopped because of what world war 2 stopped because of what hmm backbenchers how did the world war 2 stop yes good so it was the atomic bomb which was dropped in hiroshima nagasaki okay so this was the world war stopped so greatest good for the greatest number is it do you think it should have been dropped yes how many yes how many no why no it led to destruction so it is a right act or wrong act so the kantians if they were to decide the issue uh, in the american advisory committee whichever advised that if they were to decide they would have said no don't drop the bomb okay finish off the war in some other way but if they were ruled by other people who wanted to stop the war somehow and they had the 
weapon for that they would say drop it finish them okay so that is utilitarianism now you understand the two sides of the coin okay something interesting i'll show you what happened so many people died in both hiroshima as well as nagasaki several suffered morbidity as cancer and things like that you see the barren land there okay and what does that tricycle actually denote to you a child a child was riding that when the bomb fell okay so they have kept this tricycle in the museum to remind people of what had happened and what happens what happened actually when the bomb was dropped there is some reaction no so rise in temperature and fine radiation yeah but what is the physical appearance that happened hmm heat waves okay yes the cloud mushroom cloud and see one year later the us people are celebrating it with a cake which is having the mushroom shape what happened to the pilots who dropped the bomb huh who one person committed suicide the other person felt heroic okay so you see the difference in reactions so what does ethics show that try to control okay so virtue ethics depends on the character of the individual i showed you the i uh, told you the difference in characters and practical virtues can only be studied through habit you are constantly dinned don't do this don't do this don't do this so a child will ask so what what will happen and you give the reasons also okay a conscious effort to inculcate them in our daily actions until they become a part of one's very character there are other things like moral values that we cherish conforming to roles and norms in society never mind you will get those slides okay <laughs> so professional more more emphasis is given to confidentiality community i mean you have to actually respect each other's culture now this is very basic i'll come to that later so actually it is hank ten hawe who was unesco uh, head uh, once upon a time he wrote all this uh, his book has come out uh, he says first mainstream bioethics as a ha has a western bias he understood it is mostly from the west that influence is coming down because of his specific origin it is focusing on particular issues and interests only what affects them only that is emphasized but what is happening in developing countries is not spoken of much so second confronted with other cultures bioethics poorly addresses moral diversity but let me tell you in the oriental cul culture is not like that it is interspersed with teaching about what should not be done whichever religion third bioethics is simply exported to other cultures without sensitivity to moral diversity okay so this is what he called imperialism ethical imperialism the americans say we have to have written consent written consent and only written consent there was a time like that in developing country they said our community leader has given you uh, permission to uh, ask us whatever you have to ask or do with us so we are not going to give you consent because they were following the community norm of existence so they had to go back finally they had to come down 
a little and they accepted oral consent okay so why is research necessary anybody it's written there no progress of medicine okay and for that you use animals as well as humans but even before that biotechnology how many of you are here so what do you do before getting into animal studies huh cell line so in vitro okay so this was the norm at that time there was no in vitro no cell lines i am coming down from that time to modern time okay so the first experiment perhaps was any christians here yes you know about book of daniel no now you will actually see go and see <laughs> okay so uh, there was a war the king of babylon actually uh, uh, conquered israel but he knew that the jews are very intelligent set of people so he he asked <coughs> daniel the person was named daniel daniel and his companions to be in his court and he asked uh, the person in charge to give them very rich food but daniel said that please give us only vegetables and water for 10 days they took that and the, at, at the end of those 10 days their faces were more radiant than the others and they appear to give more intelligible answers than the others probably this is the first documented experience and then you have in the 10th uh, second and 10th century bc somebody remarking that people could be used these criminals could be used for the benefit of society how present times this has happened in a country any guesses yeah what is it you were saying something don't be afraid say anything you like be models okay that is good you are right we'll come to that later okay but otherwise why do you say criminals the ones who were used as models were not criminals okay in china they used these criminals to have organ harvesting okay because they thought that criminals are useless people not good enough to exist in society so why not harvest their organs okay so that that was what was said centuries ago but today we don't consider it ethical the first document clinical trial was about james lind how many of you have heard of that experiment he did yeah what was that quick yeah he very good so he had 12 sailors included in the experiment divided them into six groups one group he gave what she said the citrus food okay and he discovered that scurvy is prevented because of this okay this was his earliest experiment of course there is no ethics committee nothing of that sort then we have the two stalwarts claude bernard and louis pasteur claude bernard actually uh, uh, you can say he actually uh, wrote a book study of experimental medicine and uh, he was a physiologist but he also emphasized the fact that a person cannot be used uh, for the benefit of society okay then louis pasteur he was also from france a biologist microbiologist chemist in fact you know today we have these disciplines a chemist will be chemist he can't be a pharmacologist 
okay but abroad you still have this multidisciplinary you know um, what you call degrees uh, as professor and things like that one will be you know um, professor of transplantation professor of ethics professor of something else like that all combined into one but in our country we have these segregations so he was also like that and then uh, he he said that animals you know these products should be tested in animals first and then only in humans so this is probably uh, an example of the f documented i am all talking about documents okay first instance of informed consent where uh, this uh, uh, major walter reed uh, wanted to do experiment on yellow fever so this was in cuba so naturally you will have most of them as spanish people so this uh, document was also translated in spanish perhaps that's the first instance that there was a local translation people were asked to uh, were given the details and asked whether you want to enroll that choice was there in the beginning but once they enrolled they could not go out of the camp so it was like a captive population and they said that if you enroll you will get 100 american doll, uh, dollars in american gold and if you contract the disease you will get another 100 dollars in american gold if you die what happens that was not written okay today if a participant dies you have to give compensation in our country okay so this is uh, an example of the informed consent and then of course experimentation with your own people you know this edward jenner wanted to actually uh, try smallpox vaccination and uh, he used his gardener's son 8 year old son he even used his son okay today this will be a little guarded okay so when you take bioethics history from the western side the start of bioethics norms etc started only much much later the 17th century and what you see in red is important because the first code of medical ethics was laid down by thomas percival in 1740 and then 1847 you have the american medical associations code which actually took its basis from what thomas had de described and then in 1897 they again made it into code of medical ethics and 1947 this association adopted uh, percival code okay so we will not go into details about that uh, okay then 1960s you have the bioethics word coined 1970 you have another biochemist american biochemist who added biosphere uh, into the parlance of bioethics including ecology 1972 you have the encyclopedia of bioethics uh, the definition that i told you about bioethics is from that germany actually had good codes good ethical codes starting from 1898 1933 but what happened in what world war everything was thrown on the carpet okay you see the terrain it is beside a sea high altitude extreme cold so the nazis did their experiments on these prisoners uh using sea water to see whether it is it could be turned portable freezing experiments and also high altitude experiments all of them died okay then you have the story of joseph mengele now this man was interested in studying twins so any twins coming to the camps were carted off to his camp okay what i forgot to, to show you was the green ones that you see are the concentration camps and the red ones that you see are death camps so the concentration camp in that only our joseph mengele was doing his experiments he was <coughs> joining twins to see whether they could actually function as siamese twins 
Any other experiment that you know of? There were colored eyeballs from, uh, hanging from his ceiling, off his ceiling. They were actually the eyeballs of these twins. You can see the children, you know, without cloth, extreme cold at that time. And then I'll tell you the story of one of the twins who survived. Oh, I don't know whether this will work because Unless you have a sound, but you can see her, no, you can read. She says that she was given injection. Okay, anyway, you have seen her, no? So we will proceed further. Again, you have to open that. Okay, next one. Okay, so what happened to this Mengele? You know, most of them actually ran away to South America to escape. I mean, when the army was coming near and they knew they are going to lose, some of them escaped. They say even Hitler actually escaped, although, you know, they say that he committed suicide and things like that. They say it was a dupe who actually <laughs> did that. He escaped to South America. Anyway, this uh, Mengele was one such person who was actually called the angel of death. Now, he actually was being covered by this uh, reporter that you see, George. He actually was following him. Uh, and then he found that this man was actually interested in twins. He was continuing to do experiments. And he was probably creating an army of twins, brunettes and blondes, for his master. And he actually uh, went for swimming and massive heart attack, he died. So this fellow actually followed him up. Uh, he is a historian, actually. And that's one evidence how people can escape. You know, we have uh, in our country also people going abroad to escape the law of the land. So you, there was uh, this deliberate phosphorus burns. Uh, and then, of course, uh, sterilization experiments. You can have number of them, you know. You go to the net, you will get number of these atrocity, uh, uh, atrocities that, that were actually committed on these people. So what you see here is actually, uh, you know, the Nazi trial, the Nuremberg trial, because it was held in Nuremberg, Nuremberg trial. At that time, this gentleman is actually showing the long scar where a wound was created and it was not healing and all that. Okay, so finally, you know, they, uh, they, f they said 15 of the 23 were found guilty, 7 were hanged, and 5 were given life sentences. Now, this included also trial of judges. Uh, the sterilization experiments, these judges also had a hand in that. And what it led to was the Nuremberg Code, 1947. You have the you remember code with 10 principles, like 10 commandments. And you also have a lesson for the judiciary. So you have this from Nuremberg to Hague. 
uh, which was actually the crim criminal jurisdictions actually based their uh, uh, dictates on the Nuremberg Code. So the most important aspect when you talk about Nuremberg Code, it is about informed consent. None of the prisoners had that opportunity. So this was the highest importance given to informed consent and they were actually uh, suppose I mean this was the longest paragraph probably in the uh, code the patients were the patients they used to call subjects uh, were asked to give informed consent and they were given the liberty to withdraw if they felt they don't want to continue and also there was responsibility on the shoulder given to the uh, physician who was the investigator to withdraw them if he, uh, he or she felt that. Now I will bring in a little bit of she there. So uh, if they felt that uh, there was more harm coming to the uh, participants. Then came another international uh, uh, document which was very important, 1964 Helsinki Declaration, Declaration of Helsinki. This underwent seven revisions. But this was the one which actually laid down the grounds for setting up ethics committee. How many of you have had to face ethics committee? Not yet? No projects? None? They don't have to write any? Yeah, lots of them. They are looking at each other. That is, <laughs> they haven't submitted yet. People hate ethics committee, you know. <laughs> so, yes, 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 yes. So that was in 1975. And then you have a number of these uh, international codes. We'll not go into detail about that. Just understand 2018 was perhaps another important code which came out to do research, how to do research in resource poor settings. Now this was uh, carefully written as resource poor settings and not developing countries because, uh, okay, the blue ones that you see were the guidelines which actually laid emphasis on res how researchers should conduct themselves when they're coming from the developed country to developing countries. And the same emphasis was given more importance in this 2018 code. What it highlighted, I will talk to you about it later. So this is Henry Beecher. He studied 50, now remember this is, uh, he published an article in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, 1966, two years after Helsinki Declaration. When was the informed consent made necessary? New Rumba Code. When did it uh, get released? Yes, our independence. Okay, 1947. 1947 talked about informed consent. 1964, it was endorsed by Helsinki Declaration. Two years later, this gentleman reports about unethical practice concerning informed consent. He studied 50, uh, you know, peer-reviewed uh, articles by very famous physicians. And uh, he was not given space to write all about 50, so 22 instances he wrote in this article. You can get this in the web. And what he highlighted was lack of informed consent, mostly lack of informed consent. Undue pressure and a vulnerable population. You know, people working under you were used for that exploitation of vulnerable population, deception, not telling them what they were going to do, withholding available treatment, and withholding information about risks. Next, even full uh, 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 um, instances, Tuskegee syphilis study. This was a 40 year study, starting from 32 to 72, at that, uh, and used poor black Americans who were farmers in Alabama city, county, they call it county. And uh, 
they were suffering uh, suffering from syphilis they were taken into this study their you know progress of the disease was being studied what we say natural history but penicillin which, which was the drug of choice for treatment of this disease was not given to them although it came out in 1940s so this was ethical or unethical so it was only in 72 that it came into the media that such a thing was happening and this was by public health service department of us they had their reasons to conduct such a study but the point is that it was uh, not uh, i mean people did not like it at all when they came to know about this and there was an informed consent here which was used and the last sentence that you see there is remember this is your last chance for special free treatment today you can't advertise like that in the informed consent document be sure to meet the nurse and that nurse's name was miss Evers. okay why i'm saying that name is of importance you'll see later so there were only a few survivors after this 25 years later president clinton apologized uh, to these people saying that um, what was done cannot be undone and so on so a compensation was given of nine billion and they have a big research center in uh, alabama for that matter tuskegee so this is what is the uh, you see the lady there in the last one she's miss evers she was the nurse who was responsible you see this picture you will understand what happened actually and this Miss Evers was not actually uh, party to that. She thought it is bringing good to her people, the black people. Okay, it was a misconcept that she had, and she was responsible for getting those people enrolled because she did not know that there was this study which was unethical. So there are these books also about it. As a result of that, seven years later, you had this Belmont report. But a commission was formed for protection of human subjects of biomedical and behavioral research, which laid down three principles first. What you see, respect for persons, beneficence, justice. Then the fourth one, non-maleficence, was added to it later by the same philosophers who made this report. So respect for persons is informed consent. Okay, their autonomy, their right of privacy. Beneficence, it's a scale, you know, risk, benefit, you weigh them, okay? Justice is selection of participants, how you select them. Don't go for lower socioeconomic group. Take people from all levels of society if they satisfy the inclusion criteria. And then non-maleficence. Beneficence is one side of the coin, non-maleficence the other. Not necessary that both will be meaning the same. So you see that Nazi experiments a reaction to these instances. Nazi experiments brought out Nuremberg Court, Tuskegee trial brought out Belmont report, and then the research going on between developed and developing countries, 90% research being done in developing countries, and 90% funding coming from developed countries. Okay, in such a situation, as I told you, the instance of informed consent, no written informed consent. So the NBAC report, that is the National Bioethics Advisory Committee of US, first actually identified this problem. And then that was followed by Nafil Council of UK and CIOMS guidelines. CIOMS is actually in collaboration with WHO. Brought out the importance of taking uh, cognizance of the developing country situation and working accordingly. Now, if you look at the US regulations, it was in 1991, the circle that you see, 1991, it was laid. And that was being followed for so many years. And it got revised much, much later, first time, 2019, it got released. And how this got developed is because of this instance. 
You heard about Tuskegee trial, Public Health Service Department doing that. Same department again did a trial in Guatemala. That's a South American poor country. Okay. Now this fellow, this Cutler fellow, he was deputed there. And he actually in US he was doing this experimentation by, you know, um, uh, the syphilis. He was actually uh, u using syphilitic material uh, in the prisoners in US. His next step was to go to Guatemala to see how it affects. And it was by accident. This Susan Reverby uh, was a sort of historian. She actually uh, was studying this Tuskegee trial, went on studying it for so many years. One of the books that you saw was written by her. And uh, she, while foraging for further documents, she accidentally came across these boxes which had incriminating evidence of this Guatemala trial. And then, of course, uh, what Cutler was doing about, he, in, in, he imp impregnated this uh, material, infected material into uh, the vagina of uh, young girls, uh, the mentally affected people. He made scratches in the face and the, uh, at the nape of the neck and forearm, etc., to see how fast it can infect like number of experiments like that and then this is one of the lady who survived she was 74 year old at that time and she said that i was never given a chance to say no she was 10 year old at that time she was asked to she was in an orphanage she was asked to come in by her uh, you know orphanage people and she saw people in white coat there as soon as she came she was made to lie down her legs were pulled apart and infected material was introduced. So that's her story. And this, the presidential commission. Now this time, it was Clinton's wife as vice president and President Obama <coughs> who apologized. A small grant was given to these people. And the book that was brought was ethically impossible. So <coughs> they went through the data that was collected in uh, that place. You can see how beautifully they have kept. We don't keep our documents even now so safely, isn't it? And then those were studied. And you can see the second picture where they were all put in cartons and sent to the US archives. So you had 125,000 pages of documents, including 12,000 pages of Dr. Cutler's own papers in his handwriting. So this was donated. Uh, uh, to the Pittsburgh University in 1990. Then you have man-made situations. You are very familiar with this, isn't it? Terrorism and war, etc. Oh, you have the Sri Lankans, you have the latest one, Ukraine. So what happens in such situations? Post-war refugees, you have refugee camps, you have lack of sanitation, water, food. You have garbage collection. So naturally, you, there is a spread of illness. And then mental health uh, issues. So this is where you need to have social rebuilding. So the concept of medical impartiality came. You know, historical records show that when you know you are actually say uh, we have a war with the neighboring country and you find that the n soldiers of the neighboring country are in our territory okay the tendency is to look after your people first your soldiers first and then only the next one no? so this was impartial and this was practiced even at the time of hippocrates okay so a concept of impartiality was brought in by who? None other than our Florence Nightingale. Okay. So, and then later in 1980s, you have the women uh, um, social scientists and philosophers coming into the picture. And this is Henry Dunan, the gentleman who actually is the founder of Red Cross. 
he also actually took medical care of wounded, whether they were Austrians or French. He looked after. Uh, he took care that they were both looked after well. And he got the first Nobel Prize for that. Then we have actually the gender difference between, you know, how people view things. When it comes to gentlemen, it is the justice perspective. It's a little abstract, actually, but they try to actually talk about fairness and rights and things like that. But when it comes to women, it is care perspective because woman by nature is like a mother, okay? And they take care, uh, uh, they are more charitable in nature, so relational, contextual, empathic, etc. Now we'll talk about sand code of ethics. So I'm giving you an international picture as well. And this is the latest, actually. In 2017, the sand code tribe was actually exploited uh, for their traditional knowledge, gene mapping, and so on. And uh, there was a publication, you know, saying that Bushmen, how many of you have seen gods were crazy? So you know the Bushmen. Hmm? Very nice picture, no? Hmm. So they didn't like that they were being called Bushmen. Okay. So then they said that. They were actually struggling to bring out some code. And it was only in 2017 that they brought out the code. Privacy to be preserved. They didn't want to be, you know, uh, published as people having like this, like that, and all those uh, uh, things. You know, they didn't like it. And uh, of course, uh, honest communication. The researchers who came to them, they should have been honest in their approach. Benefit sharing, traditional knowledge, you know, so some benefit should have come back to them. Capacity building to take consent to publish photos. And see, I have put the photo where there's a back, okay? They are not shown. Face is not shown, okay? Uh, but in the net, you will find uh, faces and all that. And review research before publication. Anything on us, we will review it first. And that's how the sand tribe, uh, they were actually three groups who came together to make this code. The sand tribe leader said that come through the door, not through the window. Who comes through the window? People with bad intention, isn't it? So if you are coming through the door, you are on equal terms. And you can actually, am I going very late? Oh, I have to rush, I think. So the five values that they gave importance was respect, honesty, justice, fairness, care, and process. So the EU Global Code actually came after this in 2018. They also had four principles. And they were respect. This respect is not respect for persons, which was there in which code? I just now stated that. Which code talk about respect? Before that, before that, years ago, after Tuskegee. Ah, don't forget that. Respect for persons there means their autonomy, their confidentiality, their privacy, things like that. But here respect is for the local people, local culture, local researchers. And they should be fair in dealing with that. They should take care of the participants if something happens to them. Just not leave them like that and be honest in their intentions. And this has become uh, significant because EU researchers cannot do research in any other place where they go where there are resource poor settings. You know, resource poor settings can be in the same country, like say US. It's not necessary to come to India or Bangladesh and all that. In California, you have high rise uh, you know, buildings, very rich people. But at the same time, you also have people living in the streets. So that is a resource poor setting for them. So that's what they have to follow. And then we have Indian codes. I'll have to go on adding things. 
so i will not actually i'm just touching that indian courts started from 30th century bc and then we come to uh, 1980 about which i'll talk next so 1980 was the first booklet released by icmr which was only 8 pages at that time but it had all essential features you know it talked about uh, children vulnerable population and all that 2020 years later because of science and technology developments it had to be revised and more things had to be added 2006 it gave more emphasis for ethics committee procedures and something else also was uh, touched here and there but in 2017 the whole thing had to undergo a major process of revision let me also tell you that the icmr guidelines are considered very important by us because it is supposed to give equal and protection to human participants they say subjects uh, will ignore that okay so you have this 45 cfr 45 cfr these, these are all us 21 cfr uh, cfr that is for clinical trials us then they give importance to cios because it is who connected icsgcp it is about good clinical practice that is also global where us was a party then the two foreign ones are canadian tri council policy and indian council of medical research even the 2017 which was made has been recognized by them as equal and protect why is this important because tomorrow one is thinking of getting a uh, uh, a grant from us then the us office of human research protection will ask for ethics committee of this institution to be enrolled in their registry and that is why that that's what is called federal assurance and that's what i mean this thing um, indian council of medical research indians are recognized for that the law where it is concerned 2002 we had the indian medical council act 2005 drugs and cosmetic schedule y schedule y is no more there now and 2019 the new drugs and clinical trials rules where it is established that icmr guidelines have to be followed if you violate that action can be taken now this 2017 has 12 sections the one that you see in green are the new entrants totally new and what you see in red are the sections which got expanded to such a degree from the previous version that it became a separate section by itself the essential uh, the general ethical principle our first one is the most important one essential science has to be good if science is bad your ethics is bad biotech people listen to it very carefully okay then the blue ones i will just highlight on the blue ones because the others are actually understood social responsibility that any research for that matter should have a social value so social responsibility doesn't mean social value it means that your research should not create any ethnic divide religious divide etc etc okay maximization of benefits has been given more importance and environment protection which was part of the first principle earlier essentiality it was part of that it has become so important now that it was brought out separately then we have this general ethical issues benefit risk assessment will not go into detail about that what you see in yellow color were the ones which were added to this during the covid times about storage of biological material collaborative research public health and social behavioral research role of agency sponsors biosafety then we have the benefit risk as any research for that matter can benefit the individual or the community directly or indirectly at the same time when you talk of risk everybody knows about physical risk what people don't know about is the psychosocial risk and the economic or the legal risk that a person may have to endure and this has to be taken into account by all researcher sponsor as well as ethics committee 
Was this taught previously? Vani? Okay. Please tell me when, uh, you know, yeah. So privacy and confidentiality, what is the difference? Is privacy is the right of the individual. And confidentiality is the obligation of the researcher to keep that as a secret. So only few people will have access to that. So that is what is called controlled access. And especially when it comes to biological materials or data, it is even more important. But when you talk of privacy, there could be limitations. When, when the person has suicidal ideation or there is harm to others, like you have in pandemic, etc., or it is required by the court of law. So there is a limitation for that. And then you have the distributive justice. I'm just choosing some which you should know. Distributive justice, as you can see from the picture, what do you see? Hmm? Unequal distribution. What is the unequalness there? The person who is having the biggest one, how? the person is fat or thin fat. so the fat one needs more the thin one needs less hmm? that is called equitable distribution okay equality means all of you are given this chair that is equality okay but what is equitable That is e equality. Yes. So the point is that you are sitting in that chair that is comfortable or not, I don't. Mine is with this. Probably I am different. I am a speaker, so I get that. Okay. But in case, I take all your slippers. I am just taking your slippers. I am giving a pair to her. She says, this is not mine. Why? She needs hers, isn't it? So each one has a need. And when you satisfy that need, that is called equitable. Equitable distribution of benefits and burden. When you say burden, when you are doing research, you take people from the society, of all levels of society, for a particular disease like diabetes. It affects all levels of society. So you will not take only people from lower socioeconomic group. That is what is meant by burden. Benefits, you have got this drug, it has proven to be effective. You have done your research on, in India. You have proven it is beneficial, but you are not distributing that medicine in India. You are taking it to US. That is not ethical. So that is why you say benefit. Vulnerable population should not be used just for, as I told you, lower socioeconomic group is just one vulnerable population. And as I told you earlier, should not lead to social, racial, or ethnic inequalities. Whenever there is a potential benefit, that should come back to the participant and the institution, researcher, etc. Now, in the ICMR guidelines, 3.1.3, states about sensitivity to societal and cultural impact of such research. So it is to understand social and cultural impact of research, one must analyze how the health sector and general public engage with the results of such research. It is essential that researchers bear this in mind while planning, conducting, and evaluating research. Most of the time, you know, big plans uh, they always uh, they con consult the community which will be researched upon. And you no know, community will give you some uh, inputs, and that will be incorporated in that. And that is the ideal situation. It is called good participatory research, practice. You have this good clinical practice. You have heard about it, GCP. You put G here, P here. Put anything in between. That becomes the guideline. So good participatory practice means you are involving everyone top to bottom bottom up okay and that research will be very good 
it will increase public accountability and then when you talk about scientific and ethical research there are number of factors which are given in icmr guidelines social values scientific design community involvement and so on i will not read the whole thing in the interest of time and then we have vulnerability now vulnerable you know they can overlap clinical condition age and medical condition now a girl a uh, 16 year old girl poor girl suffering from melanoma she is coming from poor socio economic group her condition is treat, uh, non treatable in ordinary circumstances so if she can be included in the if she satisfies inclusion criteria in a study where they are giving drug for melanoma why not include her okay so clinical conditions situational economically and um, socially disadvantaged hierarchical system we have in our country our culture is hierarchical so under power you know th their power is reduced actually so those people all come under vulnerable population then you have humanitarian emergencies pandemic you know how vulnerable everyone was every walk of life you know rich poor everyone it equalized everyone so humanitarian emergencies language barrier we say bengalis no here they have language barrier don't be taken up by that they speak better malayalam than most of us okay so just imagine that you are using such people then what you have to do and also cultural differences so all these are you know conditions where you are incapable of protecting your own rights so those are vulnerable people and as i told you earlier include them only if it addresses their problem fine and the ethics committee should safeguard this whenever we talk of research participant remember two processes informed consent process and ethics committee review process you will come across this ethics committee in future anyway then you will learn informed consent uh, you have to tell everything about the project to the person and see whether the person understands that if the person cannot understand then there are other people who will step in they are called lar lar means legally authorized or legally acceptable representative i am just introducing these words to you so that you don't blink when you hear this word first for the first time okay so um, all everything should be documented generally when you take oral consent you say i have taken oral consent oral consent is oral consent that's all you have taken oral consent how do i know you have taken oral consent so there has to be documentation and this has to be done by a third person impartial witness we tell that and then participation should be voluntary no coercion and a copy of that informed consent document should be given to the participant now this has two parts you give in detail everything that is called patient information sheet and then you have a small part where you endorse that as a participant so the your language your patient information sheet will be you are in close you have to undergo investigation you will be protect all you 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 i have seen informed consent document where there is confusion some somewhere it will be written you somewhere it will be written i no all second person and when you have informed consent form it's all first person because it is i who is going to endorse that i have been told the risk benefits etc etc so that may be half page one page or one and a half page at the most and those who cannot do that for them the lar lar is what legally authorized or acceptable good and the consent can be written oral audio audio visual or even e consent during pandemic time there was a lot of this e consenting business going on when it comes to children in every case you have to give parental or lar consent but when children below 18 give you that is called assent 
zero to seven, no assent. Seven up to twelve, then it is oral assent. Thereafter, it is written assent. If a child refuses, what happens? Will you like to take such a child in the study? No. It's a very clear message. No. Most of the time, this is fear of injections. So there is no injection. Then you cajole the child. No, we are not going to give you injection. Sometimes you may try. Some people may try to soft Cadbury's and all those things. And that will be inducement anyway. So. Whatever you are going to tell the child, you have to write and give it to ethics committee because ethics committee wants to know what are you actually asking them. Okay, simple language you have to see. So, ethics committee, it has four elements. Who constitutes, who are the members of the ethics committee? Are they competent to review? How do they function? For their functioning, there has to be a standard operating procedure like a book like, like this, you know, it won't be so small as this, it will be quite thick uh, with all the SOPs, how you have to go about it, the framework. And then when you make a decision, it has to be independent of the management. Composition, I will not go into details about this. Just suffice to know that there has to be age and gender balance there. And also you have, like bioethics is multidisciplinary, you have ethics committee also as multidisciplinary, scientists and non-scientists. How did this come again? So uh, if they encounter injury, first of all, when you are calling a participant to take part in your study, you have to give some compensation this, uh, in the form of travel expense or uh, incidental expense, they are waiting there for more than two hours, then some refreshments and also if they have uh, uh, loss of wages, then also you have to compensate. So some ethics committees fi fix it at 200, 300, 500, depending on where it is, how the patients come, etc., etc. If you encounter injury, then there is a medical management as well as financial management. But if it is not related to injury, whatever medical management you give is called ancillary care. So anything else that uh, you have to encounter, it will be actually free of cost for the uh, participant. Simple integration of public health is nowadays people are talking about interdisciplinary policy. So no longer, you know, there was a fight Traditional systems will say something, modern systems will say something. Even today, IMA is fighting, okay? Uh, what is this traditional system? But if you really know about that science, you will appreciate certain things in that. So there is a belief now coming up saying that the two systems should come together. For the betterment of the patient, so acute and emergency, you can use modern medicine, prophylaxis, long follow-up, etc. you can use traditional medicine. And if there are local health practices, you actually examine those claims as well. So the major uh, social uh, public health problems are, as you all know, maternal mortality, infant mortality, infectious diseases, chronic diseases, and malnutrition. The social determinants are poverty, overpopulation, malnutrition, lifestyles, lack of access to health care, and so on. And then, what is the social responsibility and health? We are coming down to the declaration of, declaration of, UNESCO declaration of, Bioethics and Human Rights. Based on that, a report was made in uh, 2010. When was that declaration made? Vani had mentioned that. When was that declaration made by UNESCO? 2005. Okay. After that, five years later, a report was made on that. And it stated that 
there should be promotion of health and social um, development. The other point was that they should enjoy the highest attainable standard of health. So I'll not go into detail there. You can actually take it as a reference later. And during COVID-19 pandemic, we say something about corporate social responsibility. Have, have you heard about CSR? What is that? Where do you hear that CSR? Companies. They make so much of profit. Do something for the population. So they will take various ways of dealing with that. You know why? Because they are very philanthropic. They get tax reduction. Okay. So um, in during COVID pandemic time, you know, the one that was concentrating on health sector actually helped in creating awareness about it, providing primary health care, transporting health care uh, professionals because transport was not available or dock down situation, Medi medical supplies had to reach the patients. Patients had to undergo investigation so they can't come all the way to the COVID facility. They were afraid al also of coming to COVID facilities so they were asked to get those investigations done in some local facility. All those adjustments which in normal times companies will not allow uh, were done because they wanted data somehow. So um, the types of hospital social responsibility, this is again another, uh, you know, uh, these points have been taken from another reference, so I will not go into detail about it. There's a passive type and there is an active type. Then we have the 11th section, biological materials. Those who are doing in vitro studies and all those things, biotech, you are going to collect samples and you are going to have your uh, internship, I understand, in biobanking also. So you have to remember one thing, that there have been fights abroad about who owns the biological material. In the ICMA guidelines, we have made it very plain that biological material and data belong to the person from whom you have taken. The donor is the owner. No dispute about that. The researcher and the institution are the custodians of that. Okay. So bearing this in mind is very, very important. Return of results. Wherever you can return the results to the participants, it's of benefit to them. Or it's their right. You have to give. If there is any potential commercial end, benefit sharing. And then when it comes to data sets, of course, you have to have anti-hacking softwares, etc. Humanitarian emergencies, we actually experienced pandemic, no, even now it is not over. Is it over? Where, where is it existing now? In Kerala. Just take Kerala. Now and then you get reports, no? Oh, I had COVID. But where is it more prominent? Anybody knows? Patanam Titta. Who is coming from there? You didn't know that? Don't go during holidays, okay? So, um, here there's one mechanism. Suppose it is, uh, it is natural, like cyclones, etc. You know, it will come in say November, December, whatever the period is. So you prepare your proposal, get easy approval, keep it handy. And when that calamity happens, you start your research. But before starting, you have to tell the ethics committee, I'm starting. What ab about the ongoing research, COVID time, lockdown, everything and all that? You couldn't go for follow-up. You couldn't call people. Most of them have died. So what to do? Ongoing research had to be stopped for the time being. You have to inform the ethics committee, will advise, okay, stop it now. When you're resuming it, you have to again inform the ethics committee. And this is the first time that internationally everyone came together. 
so that is called principle of solidarity solidarity you know lal salam but lal salam for what working together okay otherwise it was not encouraged earlier when tsunami came our government said hold on don't come to us we will meet the need by ourselves whereas sri lanka all these pe people descended to sri lanka took their blood went back to their lab this is called helicopter research so this is exploitation i already told you about biological samples you must always be careful when you take samples from people who are suffering from diseases which has a stigma and also in genetic diseases hmm? biotech most of you might actually deal with that but i also welcome to you i <laughs> i recognize you uh, i understand you work uh, on music so genetic music gene music so that's where you also will be indulging so very be very very careful when you are taking the sample always think of their right always ask them whether you want to keep your samples for future research or not and always give them the results if they want it because in genetic diseases sometimes they may refuse to know in hiv formerly people didn't want to know the result okay so this is about access and benefit sharing when you have a potential commercial end uh, this is what i am showing the traditional uh, plant okay which was being used by a kani tribe and uh, that was actually developed and uh, patented and things like that so there was a commercial potential there and the money for the first time in the world 50% of this return was given back to the tribe not as money for their welfare a trust was created and that was taking care of their welfare etc because you are all students i thought i will just include this the influencing factor institutional culture personal preferences notions of ethics peer pressure external factors which factor affects you i would like to know which is most here vani is not looking at you <laughs> silence so you have not undergone any pressure it reminds me of kapil dev sir statement he was talking somewhere and he said that people say that um, when i played i played out of interest but i hear these youngsters cricketers saying that we were under pressure he said if you are under pressure mat khelo so it is the interest you know which is uh, the most demanding one for you to work in whichever sphere you want to work so which is actually hindering you here institution is very strict not allowing you to do things Hmm? Oh, people are now afraid to even say that. <laughs> huh? <laughs> It can be actually you can get a response and see which is most affecting them. Which of these? Is there peer pressure? Hmm. Or uh, your companion pressure? Okay. so are you under stress then don't come to college <laughs> influencing factors again from a faculty side <laughs> okay you know that famous figure no which picture ha ah, that's why i put it there at least this you will know personal preferences etc over confidence ego and status you will come across such people isn't it 
So when you teach bioethics, it can be descriptive, prescriptive, interactive. Right now we had interactive session. Interactive also can be like you are given a case study, uh, asked to learn about it, I mean read it and then discuss it. Okay? Methodologies, various methodologies, play, play acting is the best one. Actually, you can understand in no time. We had one for non-scientist members, one uh, orientation uh, you know, workshop. So there were scientist members also there. At the end of the day, they just sat like this. We didn't understand anything because all the discussion was about science. So then, please don't include scientists in the next workshop. That was one suggestion. Second suggestion was keep it in a small room, not a big hall. It was a big hall. And then second time, it was in simple terms that they were told about the guidelines, etc. And they were, after that, there was role play about informed consent and things like that. They understood everything. At the end of the day, they were so happy. So that's why, and this one, the upper one that you see is a drama which had been enacted. People, when they came and sat on the chair, people thought, hmm, what is this drama? Everybody is sitting on the chair. But when they started talking, everybody forgot about the chair. They just, you know, got absorbed into what they were communicating. Have you heard of Tom Alter? Actor Tom Alter. Hindi films? He used to come as a Britisher most of the time because of his complexion and things like that. He was one of them. And there were some TV artists also there. This was what was done in the ICMR program under the NIH project which was awarded to me. So what I'm trying to tell you is these are means by which you can actually imbibe those uh, you know, principles much more easily. And this is the Miss Evers boys. This is again the constant gardener. It's all about clinical trial. And you must know those who are going to deal with biological material. Have you heard of HeLa cell lines? Why was it called HeLa? Because of Henrietta Lacks. She's there in that picture. Have you read that book? All of you have to read that book you will actually get across so many ethical issues outlined there, which is contemporary. And it was Rebecca Sklut who wrote that. Okay? This is again a poor black American woman who had carcinoma cervix, I mean cancer of the cervix. No informed consent taken. This is 1951. Okay? When was the informed consent made necessary? Which year? Why so low? Getting hungry, I think. Yes. And this was 1951. And who made that Nuremberg Code? Americans. And this happened in America. Okay? So the responsibility of our ethical decisions are entirely ours and can be shifted on to nobody else, neither to God, nor to nature, nor to society, nor to history. Whatever authority we accept, it is we who accept it. We only deceive ourselves if we do not realize this simple point. Now I am coming to this lady, Eva Kaur. She was the one who was speaking. Earlier I showed you a video. Okay? She was one of the twins who survived. The other twin died. They were actually in the camp at the age of 10. They got liberated because of the bombing. Okay, and then they went to Israel, and there her twin sister, she passed away because she had problems. So people were asking her, was your twin, twin given some other drug? Because she was injected with a drug. She said, I have no idea. So the point was, was, they, uh, was she a control group? I have no idea, she said. And then she said she forgave Dr. Mentale after so many years and said a huge burden was off her shoulders once she forgave him. And she had been going on giving lectures everywhere, giving instances of what she suffered and things like that. 
not going into details. Very interesting story. I was lucky enough to hear it from the horse's mouth. She died in 2019 at the age of 85, very near the Auschwitz camp where she was imprisoned. And she was actually um, talking to children who had come for a picnic and a talk by her. And the other one in the center is Susan Reverby, who reported about the Guatemala trial. Okay. So just an information to all of you that Forum for Ethics Review Committees in India is holding a conference in, um, in November, beginning. And uh, I'll send you the, uh, the announcement. For the students, it's 500 rupees. Please take advantage of that. Because there are subjects which might be actually, uh, um, now the last date for abstract is over, so you can't actually submit abstract. Anything on ethics, you could have submitted actually. But maybe you are too new for that. Then there's another one by Kuhas, Kerala University, which is in January. So just look out for these things. Try to absorb as much as possible from experiences of others. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I think you must be very, very hungry by now. I have taken half an hour more. <laughs> okay. For the word of thanks, I would like to invite our research assistant, Ms. Anjali Balachandran. Good morning, everyone. It has been such an honor to be a part of this wonderful event. On behalf of ICREP, Kuzat, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guest, Dr. Nandini K. Kumar, Vice President at Forum for Ethics Review Committees in India. Thank you, ma'am. I request Nandini ma'am to accept a token of gratitude on behalf of ICREP Kusak and I request Vani ma'am to hand over the seat. I thank Dr. Meera V, Honorable Registrar, Cochin University of Science and Technology for her valuable presence in our session and for her support in all our academic activities. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Vani Kesri A, Coordinator ICREP Kuzat, whose guidance is the driving force that leads us to the challenging innovative endeavors. My colleagues at ICREP worked day and night relentlessly for the successful accomplishment of this exercise. I thank each and every one of them for their sincere and untiring efforts that constitutes the strength of our center. Our sincere gratitude to all the participants for being with us in our academic venture and for making the, pro the program a memorable one. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for being part of this program and helping us make this event a grand success. Thank you one and all. Have, wish you all a great day.